Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you're sovereign, that you're in charge of everything that happens. Lord, nothing gets by you. You're never surprised by anything, and you can stop anything that you want to, Lord. We, we praise you because you're so great, and we thank you for what you've done in our lives, that you've changed us and you've brought us up out of darkness. God, we, uh, we just want to really pray that we could be focused today on you. And as your servant, Minister Josh, comes up here to share the word with us, we pray that our, our minds would be open, that you'd be working in our hearts with your Holy Spirit. And God, we just pray that his message would have something for everybody, that we would all walk away here being better fathers, being better mothers, being better children, and, and serving you with our whole hearts. And we just give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, wow. So I've got a few things I need to share uh, this morning, and so I just want to say a couple words about what's been happening in our society uh, with the coronavirus. And so one of the things that we want to, as a church, take precautions, we want to encourage our people to take precautions. So you notice at the doors, uh, we've got some uh, sanitation stations. We want to encourage you to make sure you're washing your hands. Pastor Hunt mentioned, uh, just be careful. Uh, make sure that you're, you're cleaning your hands well. Make sure that you're cleaning off surfaces that you touch. Uh, if you cough, sneeze, please cough into your arm, uh, your, your, your elbow. Uh, don't be around people who are coughing and sneezing. So you just want to take precautions. We, we, we want to take precautions, but we don't want to act in fear. And we want to trust God because we know God is in control. And so we believe that God is in control. So a couple of things that we are doing as a church to take precautions uh, this morning, we're going to be streaming our service. So those people who, and we encourage people uh, who were sick or not able to come out, we encourage them to stay home. So we'll be streaming our service this morning. And for the next two weeks, we're going to be streaming our services uh, for that reason. And uh, so what we're doing, the schools have closed down the schools through March. And so we're going to be canceling our evening, our Wednesday night services um, the next couple weeks through March. And hopefully we'll be back doing those again in April. Uh, through the next couple of Sundays, we're going to also counsel our Sunday school classes, but we'll have service. Now, next week, we're going to do something a little different. This was the purpose of cutting down our crowd because the governor has put a ban on crowd, crowd uh, uh, numbers. And so next week, we're going we're to go to two services, an 845 service and a 1045 service, right? So you can choose which one of those that you want to come to. And uh, the purpose of that is to make sure that we're within that band and to provide a smaller crowd for that. Uh, so the two services, the first service will, the first service will have nursery, and the second service will have nursery, but the children's ministry will only be during the 1045 service, right? So if you have children who are normally in children's ministry, they will be during the 1045 service. Um, so... Some of you have asked, what, what's going on here? Is this, is this God's judgment? Is, this God's, uh, is, is God releasing some kind of judgment on, on, on the world? And my answer to that is, I have no idea. Could it be God's judgment? It could be a part of God's judgment. Could it be God's guidance? What I mean by God's guidance? Could it be this is God's way of drawing his people back to himself? This is, this is God's way of, of causing his people to be people of prayer and also drawing men and women. Because it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a dangerous thing or it's unsettling when science doesn't have any answers, right? When people don't have any answers. And so I think God is bringing us to a place where we have to depend on him. And we've got to call out to him. And men and women around the, our area, around the country, around the world don't have answers. And so that is going to open up opportunities for us who know Jesus Christ, who know the answer, to be able to share the hope that's in us, to be able to share with, with people the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I, I, I would encourage us to look for those opportunities. Look for those opportunities. People are going to be open because they have no answers to this. They're going to be open to hearing about the good news of Jesus Christ. So again, we just want to take precautions, and we're going to be praying through this. Now, the other thing I want to mention to you 
is today starts our fast. And so if you have not gotten this book that we're going through, well, first of all, there's a log, there's a fast log that we passed out in, in the bulletin last week. We have some copies of this out in the foyer. Take it, please take it when you leave. These are instructions to the fast. These are some of the things that we're fasting about. We ask you to pray about what things you want to be fasting about uh, as, as individuals, as families. What are the things that you want to be fast, fasting about? Uh, and so keep track of this. Keep this with you. Keep this in your Bible. In the bulletin today, you're going to have a, a calendar which gives you the day. So it's a 21-day fast, and it gives you the, the day, uh, like today, Sunday the 15th. This is day one. It's going to take you through uh, this day as far as this fast is concerned. If you did not pick up one of these books, please pick up one of these books. This is a book that has a devotional that we're going to be going through throughout the fast. So there'll be somebody out there after service who will be handing out these books. Now, these books are not free, but we're giving them to our congregation. We're giving them to you. If you want to give a donation, you can give a donation, but you don't have to. Uh, but each day, there's two chapters that you read, uh, beginning, and then each day there is a devotional. So there's a devotional for day one. We ask you to read that devotional and then go online and listen to the, 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 the online, listen to the prayer online as you're reading that devotional. So as you go through this book, one of the things you're going to find out is you're going to learn a lot, and you're going to want to have other people that you can discuss what God is teaching you. So I want to encourage you uh, to partner up with some people, uh, to have some people in mind as God is teaching you that you want to share what God is teaching you and hear what God is teaching them as, as we grow through this thing together. Father, right now, I just want to pray as we commit these next 21 days to you, I pray that you give us the strength to fast, to be obedient to the, the things that we've set in place. I pray that you would give us a heart to seek your face. I pray, Lord God, that we would come to know you in a real way, that you would make, expose the areas in our lives that are, you're not happy with, that we may confess and forsake them. I pray, Lord God, that we would be still enough to hear your voice, and not just hear your voice, Lord God, but to obey your, obey your voice. I pray as a congregation that you would grow us. I pray, Lord God, that you would, that you would um, teach us how to pray. That this would be a time, Lord God, where we would learn instruction from your Holy Spirit and that we would be open to hearing whatever it is your Holy Spirit wants to work in our life and wants to work in our church. And we just give you all praise right now for what you're going to do. We love you, we trust you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. I say good morning to everybody here, and I say good morning to everybody online that's watching. Um, we're, we're glad to be able to do this. Um, we're glad to be part of what God is doing uh, today and through the coming weeks. Um, so today was supposed to be Youth Sunday. Uh, we were supposed to have youth group members be part of the service and uh, me to preach on something that has something to do with youth-oriented or, or parenting or things like that. And so I chose something on parenting. And I think, I think what we'll find today is this will be something that will kind of encourage us. I know it was for me as I prepared, and I know if I prepare and I get encouraged by it and I get challenged by it, that I know it's going to be good uh, repetition to somebody else. Um, so today's... Today's uh, sermon title is The Parent Survival Guide, The Parent Survival Guide, and the whole point of this is, is not necessarily, if you've, if you've had children, or if you've not had children, or if, you, or if you're a grandparent, or if you're a friend of a family, or you're a godparent, or whatever that looks like for you, uh, these are really good opportunities and good things that we're going to be discussing today that are going to help you in the long run with helping to raise children. Because parenting is the activity of bringing up children as a parent or as a grandparent or as, uh, you know, a cousin or uh, an aunt or uncle or, or a, a, an adopted grandparent, so to say. But often when I think of parenting, I wish they had a manual. See, I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old at home, and I really wish they had a manual for that. I really wish there was some kind of like how to parent for dummies book because there are times where I just am stumped as to what to do. 
Um, so if you need a copy, I need a copy. I know I need a copy of that book. Um, but I think there's some good stuff within Scripture that we can really gain um, to, to get perspective. Now, those of you that are here uh, and those of you that are online, how many of you are grandparents? Okay. Grandparenting's great, right? Yes. It's great because you can, you can sugar the kids up and then send them home, yes. right? Instead of sugaring them up and having them spend all night, and it, well, maybe sometimes that happens. But the deal is, I have my mother and father in Myrtle Beach, and I call them quite often. And, and grandparents, maybe you can identify with this. Do you ever laugh at your bewildered kids? Do you ever laugh at your bewildered kids as they parent their children? And you hear the situation, and you, you hear the, the, the tension in their voice, you hear the, the uh, exhaust in their tone, and you just laugh. Yeah. That's my mother. That is my mother. And my mother is probably watching right now. So, Mom, thank you for laughing at me as I raise my children. Um, what happens is no one tells you how or to explain how, how to raise another human being to the detail. Like explaining to my six-year-old son, it's okay to go to the bathroom at school. He didn't think he could. When we first started this year, he, he didn't think he could go to the restroom on his own. He thought he had to tell somebody and then go. Um, no, one, no one warns you about getting thrown up twice right in the middle of your chest as you're holding a feverish child. It's not exactly your pinnacle of parenthood, okay? No one warns you that they're going to look like you, they're going to act like you, and someday they're going to show the same disobedience level that you once had. The crying, the sleepless nights, the moaning and groaning, the wailing and gnashing of teeth that happens. But they also don't tell you how much you're going to love your children. They don't tell you how deeply you feel for your child. There are no words that give that justice. There are no words that you can give to someone else to explain what that's like. And so today I wanted to kind of just sort out some things about how we disciple children, how we, how we in, in some ways reach that next generation, but more on an intimate level of how we love children well, from the home to the church and how we can go into the extended world around us. So the main point of today's sermon is this, the discipleship of the next generation is a vital mission. It's a vital mission. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture today and kind of come back to it at points uh, throughout, the, throughout the message. Um, but we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. And to kind of set the stage for you, give you some context, give you some ideas of what's going on, Moses is leading people into a new area of life, new, new area of land, new area of, of, of people surrounding them. And he wants to just tell them, listen, there's going to be some struggles with what you've learned, what you've been through, and there's, it's going to be a temptation to leave that behind. The temptation is real, and you are going to face it. Moses knew that the people were not coming out of a captivity and just going to be able to fill this land without any kind of background information or without holding to some really good choices in their lives and following after God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 says this, now this is the commandment, the statues and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Verse 3, Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that you may go well with you, and that, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord your God of, the, God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and with honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you, 
when you sit in your house, when, you're, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you shall, they shall be the frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them down on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Skip on down to chap, uh, verse 20 with me. When your son asks you in times to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and statutes and the rules that the Lord God has commanded, uh, commanded you? And you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders and great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all of his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there, and he, that he might bring us in and bring us to a land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good, for our good always, that we might preserve us alive that we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. And I thought it was interesting, later on in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 11, he mentions something again that he mentions in this passage. He comes back to it in, ele- in Deuteronomy 11, chapter ni- verse 19, it says, You shall teach them to your children, teaching them t- when you are sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. It got me thinking. Moses wanted to warn them to make God and honoring God for generations a priority of their life. But he wanted to do it in a very specific way. He wanted to do it in the little moments. The little moments that we tend to take for granted. The, the moments that we, we sort of see as down times. We have to make it part of our down time so we can make it a common practice and our uptime. Because time is fleeting. Kids change fast. They grow. The culture around us continues to grow with them. And, you know, to be honest with you, if, if we would start to think about that and how kids change and how the culture changes from when we were raised to when they, were, they are now raised, it's drastically different. Positives, positives and negatives. So Moses is trying to get his people to understand that God wants them to make him a priority, following his statutes, following his word, and making sure that that's part of their integrated family time and their downtime so that when they face anything else, they're able to hold true to what the truth is. And we can see that we can actually see this uh, as 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 we think about Uh, raising kids in the culture that we're in today. If we don't start to make some changes, if we don't start to make some changes as to where God stands in our lives and in the culture that we are in, we're going to face some serious consequences. If you think about it in the business world, um, anybody remember Kodak? They're still around, okay? Kodak's still around. But where Kodak didn't make changes quickly... They lost a lot of profit. If you look at, in 1995, Kodak had $16 billion in sales. $16 billion. And I know what that was for. It was the little cameras that you, you clicked over until it was, like, ready to flash, and it even, like, made a little noise, like, you know, wee, like, winding up, and then you'd snap the picture. Nobody knows what that is anymore because we don't have disposable cameras that much. 16 billion in, billion in sales. 2010, they were stated as 7.1 billion in sales. Almost a $10 million swing because where they were didn't match where they were. What they saw and experienced didn't carry over to a new generation. Blockbuster. Anybody remember Blockbuster? Man, I loved Blockbuster. When I was in college uh, and met my wife, we, we would actually, like, go to Blockbuster and just walk around. It was just awesome to see. And then, like, the, year, the next year it closed. So um, in 1994, Blockbuster was worth $8.4 billion. 2010, 
They were worth $24 million, and they filed for bankruptcy. So where they were didn't match where they were going. And, and, and they couldn't keep up with a lot of the other competition around them. On the other hand, there are a couple companies that I think can be a good example of us of how to identify where we can change things, where we can identify how we communicate, how we work with our children, that are very good examples of connecting with the, the, the world around us as far as what works. Disney World. Disney World in 1975 saw 12.5 million visitors. In 2019, they saw 58 million. So what has happened is they've made changes you know, different movies come out, they put a new ride in. They, they put new parts of the world that they have down there in place. And they do this to attract new generations who don't remember Bambi, who don't remember Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. But they do remember Up, they do remember Cars, and they do remember all the Marvel movies. Amazon. Amazon in 1996 was sold $15.7 million in sales. As of this year, they have sold $87.44 billion in sales. One of the largest corporations in the world. They made the changes that were necessary to reach a new generation of consumer, a new generation of people coming along. Why did they do that? Because they know that their time might run out. Kodak, Blockbuster, their time ran out. And so changes were necessary to be able to get to a point where the important stuff was the important stuff. And the stuff that we didn't need to necessarily deal with, they didn't necessarily deal with. How do we make the next generation discipleship a real priority, a real vital mission, a real important part of our process in raising children? Because time is fleeting. Time is going. And, and we've seen from these business examples that time goes really fast. You know, when you have a baby, a newborn baby, I can still remember both mine and, and just, just how precious and, and tender they were. You have 936 weeks till they leave the house at 18. When they're in preschool, you have 780 weeks. Elementary, 624 weeks. In middle school, you're down to 312 weeks. And when they're in high school, when they start ninth grade, they're already a foot out the door with 156 weeks left. So we need to have a strategy. We need to have a strategy that makes us consider the time that we have left. The time that we are able to influence now, we don't, that's the other thing that God kind of provides us with is we don't know the extent of our time. I don't know the extent of time that I have with my children. Yeah, this is a good barometer of, of how many weeks I would have left, but I don't know that for sure. Only God does. And so I need to take full advantage as a parent. You need to take full advantage as a parent, a grandparent, or even somebody that influences a child to take back the times that we forget about. And I think Moses had it right. He looked at the most mundane, the most easy, easy, like habitual times as important times to influence children. So as we come up with a strategy, I want to give you five real quick things that I think Moses is trying to kind of get to us in this passage of Scripture. Number one is this. We imagine the end. When we're raising children and we take back the time, we have to imagine what the end result is going to look like. We have to focus our priorities on what matters most. Notice I didn't say what matters because that, that could change for every cer certain person and every family. What matters most? In the context of a Christian family, what matters most is loving God and honoring him in the way we do everything we do. So what, what or who are we making and displaying as number one? As parents, 
as grandparents, as family members? What are we displaying as being the most important thing to our children? God calls us to follow after him. You know, our theme for the year is followership. And we're trying to make sure that we understand what that looks like to follow after Christ. I think one of the biggest things that we can ensure into our children, and this is sort of a Sunday school answer, but it's our spiritual disciplines that are ingrained into our lives. Our prayer time. Our time studying God's word and hearing God's heart for us. Spending time with the body. Spending time as a body of believers in a context of worship. Spending time together as a body in the context of service. Spending, spending time with each other in action steps. Not just to be hearers of the word, but to also be doers of the word as well. Next part is authentic faith. In uh, 1 Corinthians 2, it, it tells us that, And I, when I came to you, brothers did not come proclaiming to you with the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words for, of wisdom, but in demonstrative of the spirit of, the, of power, so that your faith might rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of of God. See, as parents, we have to be really careful because we, yes, we are maybe spiritually more mature. We have to get down to their level in how we tell them how things work. We have to get down into their level of where they're, wherever they're at in their starting a relationship with Jesus or maybe just understanding who Jesus is in the first place. We have to get it down to their level and then build them up to a place where they can understand doctrine, where they can understand all the good things that God has done in each of our lives. And why do we do that? Well, 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourself as God, to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of God. That's so big. That's what we do with Awana. We try to get kids to know the word of God, and we try to get them to know it in, in a level where it's one-on-one. -on -one. They have discipleship that's happening every week where they're learning and they're taking in God's word and not just taking in God's word just to memorize words and do it off a checklist, but to really retain the meaning of what's being said in that passage. And what we're making number one, we can also go into healthy habits. You know, eating, sleeping, hygiene, re relating to others. They're watching and they're forming habits off of what our habits are like. Sexual integrity, being open and honest and truth-filled. If not handled at home, they're going to get it somewhere. Wouldn't you rather have that part of your child's life be handled at home, where they have understanding of where you stand with things, instead of hearing it in a, in a health class or, or in, in some other friend's not so nice terms. It's all around them. Handle it at home so that they're ready to face the world that's subjecting them to it. Or else it'll get skewed. And then technical responsibility. Technological responsibility. I know that's kind of a new thing for us in, in the parenting world, right? But it's something that we have to be really careful about. We can't make technology number one. Can't. And, and being careful in setting boundaries for your child that makes sense, not only by their child, by their age, but by the protection level before you hand, you know, before you hand them a device that they can access the entire world at their fingertips, we might want to think about what we're doing with that. There's things that I need to put boundaries and protection places in my life before I get on my phone or on my tablet, or internet, or whatever it is. We're giving them a portal to the world wide web, for good or for bad. And so we need to be really careful about what we do, and what we set as a boundary for them. Who are we making number one? Moses said to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. 
That's who we should make number one. Number two is this. Create rhythm. Create rhythm. Increase, this is going to sound kind of funny, but just bear with me. Increase the quantity of quality time that you spend together with your kids. And what that basically means is this. Leverage everyday opportunities. Leverage everyday opportunities. When you're home, when you sit, when you're on your way, Moses got it. We should be able to take the little moments of each day and put them, you know, take those and put them into our context today. What, what kind of things do we do with our kids? Understand that as a child gets older, they spend less time with you and more time with other people. So you have to look for times. You can't make time happen, but you can look for times that maybe you were taking for, for granted. And I've actually started to do this in preparation for this study, and it's been really, really good. Because there are a lot of times that I was missing. When they're a baby, you have morning time with them, right? You go in and you maybe wake them up, or maybe they wake you up, uh, one or the other. But you spend time maybe, maybe getting them dressed or, or giving them a bath or, or things like that. Um, you have feeding time when they're a baby. And, and that's an intimate time for, for mom and baby to spend together. You have cuddle time. That's my favorite. Okay, that's my favorite is when my kids decide to come and now that they're a little older, they decide to come and sit on my lap and, and snuggle with me for a little bit. I cherish those moments. And then bath time before bed. You know, maybe you give them like, uh, I, know, I know my wife was really big when they were babies on giving them sort of that lavender smell before bed. And not only did it calm the baby, but it calmed her. And, and, and it was really a nice time to spend with baby. In preschool, Feeding time changes to drive time. Maybe you drive them to school or drive them to something else. Um, and, and, and the rest of it, morning and cuddle and bath time, kind of all this stay the same. So taking opportunities, not just at meals and not just at the common times, but taking those times that we have with our children to love on them. In elementary, the meal times start to increase. You know, they're, they're coming home. I know my son gets home and he's like, what are we having for dinner? Hold on, buddy. It's only four o'clock. Let's let's pump the brakes there, and uh, we'll, we'll decide. We'll come up with something good for us to eat. And meanwhile, every five minutes, are we ready yet? Are we ready yet? Are we ready yet? Are we ready yet? Their hunger has sort of overtaken what they think about. Take those times at meal times, not just to eat, or not just discuss something that you know was a, a major big issue for you for the day, but see how their day was. Ask them if they learned anything new. That's one thing I've tried to do with my kids is, what did you learn today that you didn't know before? Not what did you learn, because that could be, I don't know, nothing. What did you learn that you didn't know before today? Use those meal times as, as, as really influential times. In middle school, they transition to a little bit more hunger Anybody that has a middle schooler knows that you feel like you need to take a loan out for groceries, okay? Because they'll eat you out of house and home. The expectations change because of the lack of time or separation that you have. All the, all the times in elementary stay the same, but the expectations change because maybe they're in a sport now. Maybe they're in a club now. Maybe you're driving them to a play practice and, and you, you're, you're just on the go all the time. And maybe you have two middle schoolers and they do different things and you feel like you're going to be split in half and somehow you're going to be in one place this time and this time. It's crazy, okay? In high school, there's morning and meal times and bedtime, but there's also something that happens in high school. And anybody that has a high schooler or is in your family, Pay attention to this one. It's their time. Now, their time is this. They choose to share with you. Pump the brakes as soon as you can. Because when they are opening up and ready to share with you, stop everything. Stop everything. Because that is a point in their life where they're trusting you to give them a good feedback or something they're, they're searching through or, or working through uh, their opinion or their moral stance on, and they need you to guide them through that. Take advantage of those times. 
when, they're, when your high school child comes and talks to you. And then there's special times. This is like church or holidays or um, maybe, maybe you're a creative parent and you come up with abstract creative ideas for adventures. I'm not typically that guy. My wife is. Let's go hiking. I'm the, usually the guy who goes, oh, hiking. I don't know if I can go hiking today. You know, and you ponder, how sore am I going to be the next day? But you take those special times and you make them important. You utilize them the best you can. And you make them something that even in the small moments, you're creating a rhythm of what's important over time. Number three is you fight for the heart. You fight for the heart. You communicate in a way that gives the relationship value and guidelines. Number one is love is not conditional. You know, I, I read this story of a guy who shared that he asked his child, you know, when do you think daddy loves you? When do you think daddy loves you most? And the child said, when I'm good. And it kind of challenged that guy's heart. And, and I, so I, I, I went home. I, I said to Owen one night, I said, when do you think daddy loves you the most? He said, when I obey. And it kind of broke my heart. Because what I want my child to know, and what I think what every parent wants our, wants our children to know, is that no matter how much they mess up, no, how much, no matter how much they obey or disobey, obedience is, the only way, is, is not the only way to love your child. They need to know that even when they mess up, they have a safe and loving space to be able to come back to and deal with things with. There's a way to correct. There's a right way without conditional love. It's supposed to be unconditional. That same way you felt when they were born is supposed to be something that happens continuously over time, no matter how great the circumstances are. And within that, something I'm learning is picking your battles. Picking your battles. Fight for the things that matter most. What you set as mattering the most, fight for those principles. Fight for those things that you set in place. You know, in Proverbs 22, 6, it, t- it talks about training. And it's, it's, it's actually boiled down to the definition of initiate or dedicate or lead. And when you're doing those things and you're fighting for the right things and the right principles that God's set before us, you are dedicating your life to make sure that that child knows that God loves them, created them, loves them, and wants the best for them with your care and authority over them. And be on the offensive. A lot of times we get on the defensive side of parenting. We need to be on the offensive side. And we need to be looking out for the things that need our attention rather than what distracts us. A lot of times we we see the problem and we don't see the actual need of what needs to be explained through that problem. We see the mess, we see the spill, we see the we see the disobedience of, hey, be careful with that drink. It's red Kool-Aid, and we have a white carpet. Speaking from experience. And they don't obey and it spills all over the carpet, and then you have a choice to make. Do I scream? Do I look at them with the, my parents used to call it the hairy eyeball? I told you so, okay? Or do I have a teachable moment? Do I have something that I need to, that's there to distract me? Or is this something that is there to bring my attention to in a more serious way? Speak with urgency and tenderness mixed with truth. Yelling does not work. Yelling does not work. There's a certain time that you have to get stern and you have to get really serious. But I know for me, yelling doesn't work. Yelling is like a a sounding gong that just doesn't have anything other than fright to a child. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture 
is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Deuteronomy 6, 7 actually tells us that we should be diligently teaching our child. We should be fighting to draw lines in the sand of where, where Satan can go no more and God's going to take over. Number four is widen their circle. Widen their circle. Widen their circle of influence. And that's something as a parent you want to have some sort of say in. There's going to be some kids that, that, that have friends that you're like, oh boy, we're going to have to work on. You sure you don't want to hang out with? I know my parents used to say that. I'd have like this group of football guys that I would hang out with all the time in high school, and then I'd have, you know, like my youth group guys. And I would want to go hang out with the football guys all the time because we spent a lot more time together in school and in, in, in football practice and things like that. And my mom and dad used to say, you, sh- you sure you don't want to go to the youth group event thing? Nah, I'm good. Not, that's when I was sort of figuring out who I was. But as you widen that circle for your child, pursue strategic relationships for your kids. Your child needs more than just you. Did I just say that? Your child needs more than just you. Because your child is going to experience a world when they're 18, out of your care, out of those weeks that you have left, that they're going to have to navigate and go through themselves. And as much as you want to be a parent, as much as you want to be a resource, you can't hold their hand through it. It's proven in my life that I would, I would listen to stuff that my parents told me. Notice I said I'd listen to stuff my parents told me. It, it'd be in there. It might rattle around for a while. But then my youth pastor or my youth leader or a pastor at church would tell me something. Or a counselor at camp would tell me something. And, and all of a sudden it was like, wow, yeah, they're right. And mom and dad are sitting back in the car going, I've been telling you that for years. That's why it's so important to have the right relationships in your child's life. People that are going to be a positive influence. People that are going to be of godly character who are going to try their all to partner with you down the road of life of your child. It's kind of this understanding of me versus we and then us. A lot of times we don't want help. We're prideful. We don't want help. We don't want people to help us raise our kids. I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out eventually. Right? Me, the me mindset is very lonely, very tiring, very frustrated. The we collective is together. It's in more of an even load to carry. More energy is gained. And, and you also gain understanding from somebody else who might have already raised children or, or one day will. And they have a different perspective. But the team approach, the us approach is the best. Because it's, it's a team, it's unified, it's harmonious, it's powerful, and it's an unstoppable force because of Christ in us and through us. When we tag team together and we make that influence a really big thing, an important thing in our lives, and we, we raise children as, as a body, when you see a parent in need or you see a parent that's having a struggle, that's where we can step in as the body of Christ and help one another. You want to have the right kind of influences. We at church, I can tell you, are very dedicated to partnering with you as parents. We supply vetted, Christ-following, God-honoring leaders who are trained and equipped for the work of ministry. We want to make sure that every parent knows that, that we're in this with you. And we want to make sure that you also know that your child is important, not maybe as important as, it, as they are to you, but they're very important to us, and we love them very much. And I can tell you, the, the people that are here working with kids today, the people who are in the room who volunteer their time to work with uh, kids and, and with youth group members and, and young adults, they genuinely love all of those kids. And they're good role models for those kids to follow. Fifth one is this, make it personal. 
Put yourself first when it comes to personal spiritual growth. Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, it shall be on your heart, should be first, should be on your heart first. And then out of that ingrainment onto your heart, you then share it with your children. You should love God passion, passionately, but also visibly. Don't just say, well, we're going to church and, and inside you're feeling all these different emotions of how you feel about God. Your child should know how you feel about God. They should know by watching you worship. And one thing I would suggest to you is you're not, you're not here in a place of worship to be with your kids. You're here to worship as an individual follower of Christ. And when they see you worship and you all in in worship, they will see what they're supposed to do in the long run of what it looks like, what it sounds like. Impress truths on their lives. You know, Moses knew this. He, he wanted to impress the truths that they've seen, heard, and experienced down the line as far as they possibly could. And he wanted it wanted to be done practically and hastily. Explain so that you, you, you have understanding in the phase of their life. But give urgency of why we should do these things. Why should we follow after God? What's the importance of this in the, in the life that we have? Here's something that I'm learning too. Give testimony personally and authentically. Share what you're learning from God's word. Share what you're learning on your own. Share where you struggle. A lot of us don't want to show ourselves any kind of weakness or anything like that to our kids. When we do, they, they see how human we are. They see what bothers us. They see what is in us that's causing us to maybe rethink how we do certain things. Don't be afraid to apologize to your child. They need to know that you mess up as well so that they need to know that you can make corrections and move forward. Don't be afraid of sharing your hurts. It's real. They need to be able to know that and be able to then be able to express those same feelings and emotions to you as well. And let me just say this. You need more than just your child. It sounds weird, but you need more than just your child. Model discipleship in your home first and foremost. That's, that's what Moses is talking about. But also take the time to help other children. Be sure to get involved in, in, in the body. There are kids that don't have a stable home. There are not kids that have a dad or a mom. Or maybe they have one of both. Or maybe they're raised by grandparents or aunts and uncles or foster care. And they need somebody. They need a male influence or a female influence in their lives that you don't know who in the world needs you. You need to take that very seriously and think about what, what kid needs me in their life. Outside of just mine, I'm going to do the best I can to influence and, and, and do everything I can to, to raise my children for the Lord. But who else needs me? Be willing to disciple other kids along with yours so that your child sees how discipleship works. From generation to generation, I really feel like this has been a very flawed system we don't show people how to disciple others in our own lives and so we have a call to be able to hand this down from generation to generation to generation but we need people to set a trail ablaze for us to see how it works to see what works Because here's, here's the main kind of ending point for us today. Your job as a parent, as they grow and as time goes by, is to gradually transfer a, your child's dependence on you away from you and rest solely on God. As you wrestle with all different kinds of things and as you wrestle uh, through the difficult times, the good times, 
Your job is to eventually push them to a point where their faith is their own and they stand on their own two feet, ready to disciple the next generation. Your job is to prepare them for that. That's why Moses is telling them, you need to do a really good job of doing this because it's vital to the mission that we have at hand for generations to come. But as a mom and dad, we, we know, and my parents have told me, parenting never ends. In fact, you might feel like opening your own practice for counseling. I know my mom has actually thought about that because my, mom, my sister and I call her constantly. Mom, what would you do in the, what would you? And those times are the most sweet times that I have in my life to be able to get perspective from my parents but also for them to encourage me to stand on my own two feet and learn from my failures and learn from my triumphs. All the while, my parents always encourage me to put God first, make sure that God is the central figure in my life. I think Proverbs sums it up pretty well because we we can't, We, we can't live this, world, this, this life in this world without first understanding that we need to gain some understanding. And from God's word and from the experience of others that are godly people and from the people that teach us, and I think of my, my mind was flooded with people that have influenced me, and I think I've shared some of those names before, but just the influence that has happened down the line in my life and the different people God has used If those people went off their own understanding and their own heart, I'd be in a very different situation. But because they honored God and because they loved God desperately, I think they followed through with Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make the paths straight before you. If you're a parent, please know that you're not alone in the battle for your child. Please know that you have people that love you, that love your children, that love the Lord, who want to see the next generation just blossom for Christ. We want to see the world changed because of this next generation coming. We want to see children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, even great-great-grandchildren influence more and more of the world for God. But it starts at the home right now. It starts in the times that you're up, in the times that you're down, when you're on your way, when you're sitting, when you're standing, when you're at your home, or whether you're somebody somewhere else. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And convey that to your children as much as you can. Every chance you get. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Lord, thank you for this time that we're able to spend together today. Well, we know that in uh, times like these, it's, it's hard to know exactly what to do. But Lord, we know that, that you, are, you ordained this time for us to be together. Lord, you are sovereign. You are in control. You are seeing everything unfold around us. And Lord, we ask for wisdom and patience as we seek you. Lord, as we uh, raise kids and as we work as a church to help families, we ask that you would help us to influence in a correct way, in in a right way, rightly handling the word of truth. And we ask that you would help us to, to find those little moments in our day as parents or as grandparents or, or as, or as friends that we would be able to influence in every area of of our our kids' lives with your love, with your truth. And the next generation would change the world around them and around the world. But we ask that you would help us to influence well and love you well. In Jesus' name, amen.